Dear people watching and listening, Assalamu alaikum. Kindly like and share this video and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Please support my channel by contributing to my Patreon account so that I can continue making the audiobook series. Salahuddin al Ayyubi, Volume 1 Crusades prior to the rise of the Ayyubid state. Start of Part 1 of Chapter 4 Wisdom of Nur ad Din's dealings with the Fatimid state. Roots of the Ismaili Shiites and the Fatimid state. After the death of Imam Jafar ibn Muhammad as Sadiq, the Shiites divided into two groups who both attributed themselves to Jafar as sadiq One group transferred the imamat to his son Musa al-Qazim. They are the Itna Ashari Shiites. The other group denied that he was the imam and said that the imam after Jafar was his son Ismail. This group is known as the Ismaili Shiites. Abdul Qahir al-Baghdadi said concerning the Ismailis, they transferred the imamat to Jafar and claimed that the imam after him was his son Ismail. al shahrastani commented, The Ismailis differ from the Musawis and the Itna Asharis in that they attribute the imamat to Ismail ibn Jafar, his oldest son, who was mentioned in the texts initially. They said that as Sadiq, may Allah have mercy on him, did not marry any woman after his mother, that is the mother of Ismail, and he did not take any slave woman as his concubine, as was the way of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with Khadija, and as was the way of Ali with Fatima. The Ismailis are one of the branches of the Shiites and are named after Ismail ibn Jafar as Sadiq. But they are also known by names other than Ismailis, such as al -Batiniya. They were given this name because of their belief that for every outward, visible manifestation, that is Zahir, there is an inward, invisible manifestation, that is Batin, and for every revelation there is an interpretation. Among them are the Karamita and Mastakiya by which two names they were known in Iraq. In Khurasan they were called Al-Talimiya Al-Mulhida, also known as the Atheist Educationalists. They did not like to be known by these names. Rather they say, we are the Ismailiya, because we are distinguished from the other Shiites by this name. The Rafidi Fatimid state was established in 296 Hijri, that is 909 common era in North Africa by Ubadullah the Shiite after Kairawan fell to his troops and Ziada at Taglibi fled to Egypt in Jamadius Sani, 296 common era. The pledge of allegiance to Ubadullah al Mahdi took place in Kairawan in 297 Hijri, that is 910 common era and the rule of Ubadullah the Shiite lasted for 10 years, according to some historians. Ubadullah al-Mahdi Ubadullah Abu Muhammad was the first of the Batini dissident Ubadi caliphs who turned Islam upside down and declared themselves to be Rafidis. They conceived their Ismaili madhab and sent preachers to deceive the hill folk and ignorant people. Ad Zahabi mentioned what was said about his lineage. Then he commented, According to scholars, his father was not known. Because when As Sayyid ibn Tabataba asked Al Mu'iz, who was one of them, he said, Tomorrow I will tell you about it. The next day, he heaped up a pile of gold, then pulled his sword halfway out of its scabbard and said, This is my lineage. Then he told them to plunder the gold and said, This is my noble descent. 
the Mufti of Libya, Sheikh Tahir Azawi, may Allah have mercy on him, said in his biography of Ubaidullah al-Mahdi. He was the founder of the Ubaidi state and the first of its rulers. He was of Iraqi origin. He was born in Kufa in 260 Hijri and hid in the city of Salamiya, the center of the Batini Ismailis in northern Syria. From the day he was born until he settled in Salamiya, he was known by the name of Sayyid ibn Ahmad ibn Muhammad ibn Abdullah ibn Maimun al qadha It was in the region of Salamiya, the focal point of the Ismailis, that Ali ibn Hassan ibn Ahmad ibn Muhammad ibn Ismail ibn Jafar as sadiq had died. And the Ismailis built a shrine to him in secret and decided to transfer the imamat from the descendants of Ismail ibn Jafir as sadiq to their son by means of spiritual marriage. He added, This is the origin of Ubadullah al-Mahdi, and this is the origin of the Ubadis who are named after him. It is said that when Ubadullah entered Afrikiya, also known as Africa, meaning Tunis, he showed his Shiism and openly reviled the companions of the Messenger وسلم, and his wives, except Ali ibn Abi Talib, Al Miqdad, Amr ibn Yasir, Salman al Farisi, and Abu Dhar al Ghafari. And he claimed that the companions of the Messenger وسلم, after his death, except for these few whom they mentioned. People who followed the Sunnah in Karawan at the time of Banu Ubaid, that are the Ubaidis, were subjected to extreme persecution and had to keep a low profile. On many occasions they were put to severe trials. When Banu Ubaid prevailed and appointed Hussain al Amah, also known as the Blind, he started the practice of open slander and insult in the marketplaces, enchanted verse which indirectly reviled the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in phrases which were recorded such as curse the cave and what it contained and the cloak and what it covered and so on. What is meant by the cave is the cave of Saur where the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu hid from the polytheists who were pursuing them during the Hijra? These words reviled the Messenger وسلم, and Abu Bakr ta'ala anhu, equally. They also reviled the Messenger's family وسلم, who were covered by the cloak. Head of rams and donkeys were hung up at the doors of shops with pieces of paper attached to them on which were written the names of the companions. Times were very difficult for people who followed the Sunnah. Anyone who spoke up or objected was killed and their bodies mutilated. Ubadi Crimes in North Africa The Rafidi Shiites committed numerous abhorrent crimes, including the following. Exaggerated claims about Ubadullah al-Mahdi they raised him even to the level of divinity, saying that he had knowledge of the unseen, or that he was a messenger. Badr al-Din ibn Qazi Shaba explains, He, al-Mahdi, had preachers in North Africa who called people to him and to obey him. They took covenants and pledges from people and told them different things about him according to their levels of understanding. They would tell some people that Al-Mahdi was the son of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the proof from Allah for his creatures. They told others that he was Allah, the Creator and Provider. The fact that they claimed that he was a God can be seen from the actions, words and poetry of his preachers. There was a man called Ahmad Al-Balawi al nahas who prayed facing the direction of Ruqada when Ubadullah was there, and it was located to the west. 
When he moved to Al Mahdiya, which was in the east, he prayed in that direction, as if it were Makkah al Mukarramah. This belief was prevalent among many people at that time. Among the poems that spoke of his divinity were the lines of Muhammad ibn al Badil The Messiah has come to Ruqada. Adam and Noah have come there. Ahmad al Mustafad came there. The ram and the sacrifice, that is Ismail, came there. Allah the Most High came there. Everything else is as nothing. As for the claim that he had knowledge of the unseen, this is clear from the oath sworn by some of them, as they used to swear by the one who has knowledge of the unseen and the visible, our Lord who is in Rukada. Knowledge of the unseen is one of the unique characteristics of the divine, and no one has knowledge of the unseen except Allah, as he says. Say, none in the heavens and the earth knows the unseen except Allah, nor can they perceive when they shall be resurrected. Quran, chapter 27, verse 65 And with him are the keys of the unseen, all that is hidden, none knows them but he, and he knows whatever there is in the land and in the sea. Not a leaf falls but he knows it. There is not a grain in the darkness of the earth, nor anything fresh or dry, but is written in a clear record. Quran, chapter 6, verse 59. Similarly, oaths should not be sworn upon any created being, rather they should be sworn upon the Creator. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, said, Whoever wants to swear an oath, let him swear by Allah or else remain silent. There are also hadiths which forbid swearing by one's forefathers. Oppression of everyone who disagreed with their madhab. This was in addition to everything mentioned above, quoting from the words of Qadi Tayyib about their reviling the companions and hanging up the heads of rams above the names of the companions and other abhorrent and reprehensible acts that they used to do. They would force people to join their madhab by threatening to kill them and they did in fact execute 4,000 men during one period. Al-Qabisi said, Those who have died in Dar al-Bahar, that is the Ubaidi's prison, in Al-Mahdiya from the time when Ubaidullah entered the city until now, is 4,000 men. They died from torture, including scholars, devoted worshippers and righteous men. This is in addition to those who they killed without imprisonment and mutilated their bodies in the streets of Karawan. This affected the course of academic life, but despite that these trials only led the people of Muslim North Africa to increase their resolve, patience, seeking Allah's reward and adhering to the Quran and the Sunnah. Prohibition on issuing fatwas according to the Madhab of Imam Malik they forbade the religious scholars to issue fatwas according to the madhab of Imam Malik and regarded that as a crime punishable by beating and imprisonment and even death on some occasions. They followed that with a type of psychological terrorism whereby the body of the slain person would be carried around in the marketplaces of Karawan and they would call out this is the recompense of one who follows the madhab of Malik. They did not allow anyone to issue fatwas except those who followed their madhab. They did this to the juristic scholar known as al huzi Abu Abdullah Muhammad ibn al-Abbas ibn al-Walid, who died in 329 Hijri. Abolishing certain sunnah practices and adding to others. They added the phrase Hayala Khair al Amal, come to the best deed to the Adhan. And they abolished the Ravi prayer after letting the people pray it for one year. 
For this reason, most people stopped praying in the mosques. And woe betide anyone who omitted the phrase Hayya al khair al-amal from the Azan. An example of that is what was narrated from Arus al muadzin who died in 317 Hijri, who was a muadzin in one of the mosques. Some Shiites testified that he did not say Hayya al khair al-amal in his Azan. As punishment, his tongue was cut out and placed between his eyes, and he was paraded around Karawan, then killed. Nevertheless, some scholars understood the plot of the Obaidis and their evil aim, which was to empty the mosques of worshippers. In order to ward off this evil, they gave permission to the Muazzins to add the phrase Hayya ala khair al-amal to the Azan because omitting it would lead to a greater evil. One of these scholars was Abu hassan Ali ibn Muhammad ibn Masrur al-Abdi al-Tabagh, who died in 359 Hijri, who was a man of piety, worship, and devotion. He understood the aims of the Ubaidis and said to the Muazzins, Recite the Adhan according to the Sunnah in your hearts. Then when you have finished, say, Hayya ala khair al-amal, because Banu Ubaid want to empty the mosques. So you doing this, as you are excused, is better than emptying the mosques. Banning Gatherings The Fatimid state was eager to ban gatherings for fear of revolution and rebellion against them. Hence they sounded a horn at nightfall, and anyone who was found on the streets after that would be beheaded. They would also break up any gathering for the funeral of any scholar who died. Such actions are still perpetrated by oppressive police states, which do not accept any view but that of their rulers, tyrants and pharaohs. Pharaoh said, I show you only that which I see correct, and I guide you only to the path of right policy. Quran Chapter 40, verse 29 Destroying the Books of Those Who Followed the Sunnah They destroyed the books of those who followed the Sunnah and forbade people to circulate them, as they did with the books of Abu Muhammad ibn Abi Hashim at-Tajibi, who died in 346 Hijri, who died and left behind dozens of books, all written in his own hand. They were taken to the Sultan of Bani Ubaid who seized them and did not let people have any access to them, out of spite and hatred towards Islam, preventing Sunni scholars from teaching. They banned Sunni scholars from teaching in the mosques, spreading knowledge and meeting with students. The books of the Sunnah were only read in homes, for fear of Bani Ubaid. Abu Muhammad ibn Abi Zad, Abu Muhammad ibn At-Taban and others used to come to Abu Bakr ibn Al-Labad, the Sunni Sheikh of Karawan in secret, hiding the books in cloths wrapped around their middles until they were soaked with sweat out of fear of Banu Ubaid. Abolishing Sharia Law They waived all Islamic obligations for those who followed their call, whereby they would take them into a cellar and Ubaidullah would come in wearing an animal skin turned inside out and crawling on all fours, saying ba to them. Then he would let them out and explain these actions to them. When I entered on all fours, what I meant by that was to teach you that you are like animals with nothing, no ablution, no prayer, no zakah, no obligations at all. All of that is waived for you. As for the animal skin turned inside out, what I meant by that was to teach you that religion has been turned upside down. As for my saying ba to you, what I meant by that was to teach you that all things are permissible to you, including adultery, fornication, and drinking alcohol. forcing people to break the fast before the moon was sighted. 
They would often force the people to break the fast of Ramadan before the new moon of Shawwal was sighted. They would even kill anyone who issued a fatwa stating that there was to be no breaking of the fast until the new moon was sighted, as they did with the juristic scholar Ibn al-Hubula, the Qadi of the city of Barqa. ad zahabi wrote in his biography, The Imam and Martyr the Qazi of the city of Barqa, Muhammad ibn al-Hubula. The Amir of Barqa came to him and said, Tomorrow is Eid. He said, We would see the new moon first. I will not tell the people to break the fast and bear their sins. The Amir said, Instructions to that effect came in a letter from al-Mansur. The view of the Ubadis was that they should break the fast based on calculations and should not pay any attention to the sighting of the moon. The moon was not sighted, but the next day the Emir ordered that there be drums and banners and preparations for the Eid. The Qazi said, I will not go out or pray the Eid prayer. So the Emir ordered another man to deliver a khutbah, and he wrote to Al-Mansur, telling him what had happened. Al-Mansur ordered that the Qadi be brought to him. He went to him and Al-Mansur said to him, Change your mind and I will pardon you. But he refused. So he ordered that the Qadi be hung out in the sun until he died. He kept asking for water because he was thirsty, but was not given any. Then they crucified him. May the curse of Allah be upon the wrongdoers. Erasing all reminders of the Sunni Caliphs. The rulers of the Fatimid state in the Maghrib strove to remove all reminders of the Sunni Caliphs who had come before them. Obad Allah issued orders that the names of the rulers who had built the fortresses and mosques be removed and his name be put in their place. This Patini, Rafidi Shiite appropriated the endowment funds and the weaponry of the fortresses. He expelled the worshippers and al muravids from the castle of Ziyad al-Aglabi and made it a storage facility for weapons. Bringing their horses into the mosques one of the many crimes of Ubadullah was that his horses came into the mosques. When it was said to their owners, How can you let them into the mosque? They answered, Their dung and urine are pure because they are the horses of Al-Mahdi. The caretaker of the mosque objected, so they took him to Al-Mahdi, who killed him. Ibn Uzhara commented, At the end of his life, Obadullah was punished with an appalling disease, worms at the end of his anus that ate his intestines, which continued until he died. Modern Muslims who read the history of the Ubadi Fatimid state do not know anything but that which is written for them of the political history of this state. So and so died, and so and so succeeded him, and it was a state which loved and propagated knowledge meaning books of philosophy. Few mention the way in which these Patinis oppressed the Sunni scholars. Even those who study Islamic history mention al muayyiz Lidinillah al-Fatimi as if he was one of the heroes of history. All of this is the result of a failure to interpret our history in the light of the proper Islamic creed. In fact, some of the historians who have written our history were influenced by the Orientalist schools or by Rafidi Shiite thought, and they were paid to erase the facts and distort history. The Batini Islamic conflict is still ongoing nowadays. Ideas do not die, they only change their cloaks. The enemies of Islam are still teaching in secret and openly, night and day, to put an end to the correct belief which the Ummah received from the beloved Messenger. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, blessings and peace of Allah be upon him, his noble companions and unblemished members of his household, 
May Allah be pleased. End of part one of chapter four.